Hello, welcome to the webinar today. Today's session, we are discussing graduate law admissions. Uh, the presenter for today is Mr. Andrew S. Horsfull, Syracuse University College of Law. Andrew is going to part with success strategies for putting together effective personal statements and for preparing for interviews for your law admissions in the United States. At the end of today's session, you will have scope of getting your questions answered by Andrew. Andrew, could you please take over? Yes, thank you very much, Shandi. It's a pleasure to uh, give this presentation and to provide some information to, to your students. Uh, my hope today is to have a conversation uh, uh, about the admissions process, uh, particularly two pieces of the admissions process that I think are probably the most important. So I'm happy to speak about both of those today, provide you an inside admissions perspective uh, from the way that I handle um, the admissions process and these pieces uh, for my students and to hopefully provide some valuable uh, takeaways and tangible advice for you uh, and for, for our student uh, listeners. So thank you very much. Uh, a little bit about me before we get started. Oh, excuse me. We we're here. Um, so I'm the Assistant Dean for International Programs. I handle admissions for our graduate law programs. We have a Master's of Law in uh, American Law. We have a few other um, semester exchange programs. We handle international JD admissions and a variety of other international initiatives. I've been doing this for about five years. Uh, I'm an alum of the College of Law here at Syracuse. Uh, and so I've, you know, reviewed and worked with thousands of applicants, uh, for foreign applicants, to the law school. Um, and so I'm drawing on my own, inf my own information and experience, uh, but also that of my colleagues in the field at other law schools and over the years, uh, what I've learned from them along the way as well. And so it's a pleasure to share with everyone uh, the information that, that I've learned and the tools that I use. Uh, to hopefully give you some insight into the uh, the other side of the admissions admissions piece. And for a little bit more context, just to show you where I am physically located today during this presentation, Syracuse University is in Syracuse, New York. We are a private research university of about 22,000 students, graduate and undergraduate. About 4,000 of those students are international. It's a beautiful campus, a wonderful place to be a student. Uh, most of our um, international students are graduate level. Um, we have many here at the law school, as well as in our uh, engineering programs, journalism, public administration, um, information studies as well. So um, we, we tend to offer a variety of different disciplines here at Syracuse. And uh, I think it's just helpful just to orient you as to, as to where I'm uh, coming from and uh, and giving the presentation from. So let's move into a discussion real quick about the different types of graduate law programs. I won't spend too much time here, only to say that uh, as an international student, you have a few options when it comes to the type of program that might be the best fit for you. I've put a few of those programs down here and listed those. And for the purposes of, the, of this presentation, I had included a box along the bottom, which would tell you, um, in terms of a personal statement and an interview, whether those are common or uncommon as part of um, expectations in the admissions process. Uh, so you can see here that um, for the Juris Doctor, which is the traditional three-year American legal degree, uh, the personal statement is, is required. Uh, we'll talk about that in more detail later. Uh, but an interview really is not part of the admissions process. For all the other graduate programs for most law schools, including Syracuse, we have an accelerated JD, which is a two-year condensed JD, uh, a Master's of Law, usually a one-year LLM, and then a doctoral program, uh, SJD. Uh, those all require a personal statement, and usually an interview can be expected during the admissions process. So this should at least give you uh, the landscape of what types of programs are available to you. Um, and certainly on, on our website and the websites of other schools, they'll get into the very specific details of um, uh, what the program offers and what the admissions requirements are for each program. Starting from a very broad 
perspective. This is sort of the higher level view of what your application should involve. Um, every application for a graduate law program will require transcripts. It's important when entering an academic graduate program that we want to see how you've done in your undergraduate degree. Some of the programs I've listed uh, earlier on the previous slide will require that your undergraduate education be in law. So they will want to see that you have a bachelor's of law or an LLB degree. Uh, most always, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you'll, you'll include a personal statement. A resume provides a nice chronology of your personal and professional history and background. Letters of recommendation, also valuable. Uh, we won't get into those too much during this discussion. Uh, LSAT scores, the L LSAT is a, it's an entrance exam for JD programs in the United States. Uh, TOEFL or IELTS, if you happen to be a student whose um, native language is not English or official language is not English, uh, then those scores will be relevant. The Skype and personal interview, which we'll talk about in more detail. Uh, and then if you are applying for a PhD level uh, program, a research proposal will be important also. So I've highlighted here two things that we're really going to get in depth uh, during this conversation, the personal statement and the Skype interview. Uh, happy to discuss later any questions that you might have about any of these other, these other factors, but we're really going to dig into the details uh, with these two pieces. I think they're the most important pieces of the application for the student. Certainly it's what you would have most control over during the admissions process and uh, really can frame and position yourself through these, through these mechanisms, um, I think, to position yourself for a successful admissions review, despite perhaps having a lower score or lower grades or maybe no professional experience. The, the personal touches, the personal statement, the Skype interview really can, um, I think, position you in a favorable light to an admissions committee. <clears throat> so we'll talk about that talk about that now. And so starting with the personal statement, I've included a section here, and I have to apologize, I've included a lot of words and language. We're going to go through all of this together. I just think it's critical, it's very important that I put all this out there for your review. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll walk through it step by step together. Uh, I've included at the top here, uh, this is my inside admissions perspective. It gives you a chance to see how I approach the personal statement when I review an admissions file. Uh, it's the second thing that I read. Uh, the first thing I go to is a resume or a CV. Uh, and that's really because that, that provides sort of a very, very organized general chronology into where you've studied, maybe how many years you've been out of your education, what you're currently doing in your profession. That's great. That gives me a frame of reference in terms of, of who you are academically and professionally. But more important than that is the personal statement. It's an opportunity for you, in your own words, to tell me about yourself, to tell your personal story. And so um, I've given some practical advice here in terms of the layout of a personal statement. You should spend the first one to two paragraphs giving an introduction of yourself, walking me through a little bit of your more recent personal and professional background, what you've maybe currently been doing, uh, why you're seeking to pursue this program or, or, or any graduate law program, I think is the critical piece here. What's generally interesting for me when I meet an applicant, either when I review their file or when I have a Skype call with them, is I, I want to know why. Why pursue legal education generally? Why pursue a graduate law program? Why go on to do an LLM or a JD perhaps? Um, and, and why in the U.S.? And, and just give me a sense of what your reasons are for why this may now be an opportunity for you. They're, they're generally interesting for me because I can perhaps help you um, and guide you along in terms of what might be the best fit, best option, best courses for you to take, things of that nature. Um, I do, as I said here, um, interested to know perhaps why Syracuse, if there's a particular connection to Syracuse, if you've received an email from me or you've met me uh, in my travels, or perhaps you know a professor or an alum from Syracuse, if there's any connection you have to Syracuse, to my particular school, I think that's important to note. If you're applying to any other school as well, um, I think they'll, they'll welcome the opportunity to learn any personal connection or interest that you have in that school. So I dedicate a little bit of time to that. Um, 
as sort of optional pieces, explain any gaps in your resume. If perhaps in the chronology of your personal or work history, there's a three-year gap or a five-year gap in the dates, per se. Um, you know, maybe flesh that out and explain that. Uh, you, you would want to use this as an opportunity to um, uh, explain any ambiguities or questions that might arise from the review of your application. If you have started your education and took a few years off or maybe had a really bad semester, but you have a valid reason why and want to explain that, um, take, the, take the opportunity in the personal statement to do that. I always prefer when students highlight these things for me and bring them to the front and explain them. I tend to review those explanations through a more favorable lens for the student if they're honest and willing to talk about perhaps some of the weaknesses they think might be in their application. Uh, as opposed to you know, having these unanswered questions in the review, wondering perhaps why a certain thing um, exists in, in, the, in the admissions file. Uh, and then if there's any other information you think is important or relevant for me to know, certainly include that also. In terms of a few more details here about the personal statement, these are my personal tips. Uh, having reviewed hundreds, perhaps thousands of these personal statements over the years, um, best piece of advice is not to overthink it. Um, and that goes into my next piece, which is to be, be concise, but be complete. And the question arises, pretty often in terms of how long should a personal statement be? Are there limitations or requirements? And the, the answer to that really is no. Um, there's no minimum or maximum requirement for what makes a good personal statement. My advice is at least one page. I think you know, one page to tell your story and include those sections that I've identified earlier, um, that's sufficient. That can be very sufficient. If you go too long, two pages, two and a half pages into you know, three, four, five, sometimes that can just be too long. And if you're just writing to write, um, I think the, the admissions reviewer realizes that we're really just trying to get a, a good, clean sense of, um, of your background and your goals. Right? Uh, be personable. This is the personal statement. So it should do more than summarize your resume. Uh, we've, we've got your resume in front of us. That's great. Uh, but but give us a story. Give us a, uh, a personal anecdote. Tell us tell us your story. And, and and as I keep saying, you know why why pursue this program? Why why the interest in this particular degree? Uh, this is going to sound interesting, perhaps to some of you. But I I always tell candidates to look backward. For now, look backward. So when I review the personal statement, <laughs> I like to know your story and what has brought you up to this point where now you are ready for this type of a program. And so walk me through your, your history. Walk me through your past. Tell me about your legal education. Tell me about your professional history. Um, what, ha what is it about your personal journey that has now prepared you for this point where you're ready to take the next step to a, a graduate law program? That's really what I hope to read in a personal statement. I'm not so interested in all of the things you're going to do after the law degree. And people spend a lot of time, sometimes too much time, writing about, um, you know, I'm going to get my JD or get my LLM, and then I'm going to do X, Y, and Z and do these amazing things and solve all these, these problems. That is great. I mean, that, that's certainly a very noble cause, and I hope that with any, anyone pursuing a legal education, you, you, your plan is to become a productive member of modern society. Um, but that doesn't tell me all of that much about you now and, and your personal history and your story. So just in terms of sort of general advice, when students are wondering, where do I start? What do I write about? You know, I, I, can't, I can't find the words. I always say, you know, Start backwards. Walk me through your personal history. Uh, look backward for now. Uh, we'll talk about your goals later in the Skype interview. Um, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but really, I hope that should maybe help frame up um, how you should approach the personal statement in the beginning. Also, uh, be authentic. We can usually tell if somebody else has written your personal statement. 
Um, certainly, if there's our, our language issues that we identify in one piece of the application and and see inconsistencies in other parts of the application, then uh, that's that pretty clear to us uh, as we read the file. So make sure that this is something that you've written. And certainly, it's okay to ask someone to edit it and make sure that it sounds okay and you haven't made any any catastrophic grammatical mistakes. But it should certainly be you telling your story in your own words. And so um, we, we can sometimes identify if that hasn't been the case uh, for some students. Uh, lastly, of course, proofread for common errors. You want to make sure that you at least have the name of the school accurate. Uh, if you're referencing um, you know, the wrong school, submitting a personal statement elsewhere, it doesn't disqualify you from admission. It just, um, it's kind of an embarrassing moment uh, for the applicant and um, doesn't, doesn't start with the best impression. Um, so just give it a fresh read before you hit submit and send it on. Um, can't hurt at all. And if you're, if you're being concise and you're writing a brief personal statement, um, it shouldn't take that long to proofread either. Okay, so I hope that's some helpful advice as it relates to the personal statement. We're going to move on to the Skype interview. I'll say Skype a lot. It's really an interview. I happen to use Skype most often. It's the easiest online platform to use. Sometimes I'll move into a phone interview if that's more appropriate uh, or if that's just easier for the student. Um, but it is a necessary piece of the admissions process for me. Um, I should say that some schools do not have an interview component. Uh, we still do, uh, and I know a lot of other schools still have the interview. I think it's a very valuable piece. I, I take and welcome the opportunity to have a conversation with the students to make a personal connection. I want to talk to you. I'd like to meet you virtually. I'd like to see you uh, so that you know, one, that I'm a real person and I have a real program and a real school uh, and can 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 answer your questions. Uh, but likewise, I want to know you and I want to see who I'm reading about in the admissions file in front of me. Um, I just think that's an important piece of the connection. Um, we're asking you as an applicant to heavily consider us as a program. We're asking you to pick up your lives and spend a lot of your time and money and personal uh, resources and efforts to come and study with us. And so um, I think it's I think it's a worthwhile endeavor to take the time to have that personal conversation with you just to um, make those introductions early on. And so that's that's my um, that's part of my sort of insider perspective on the uh, on the interview. Um, and so this actually this leads to what I was talking about earlier. While the personal statement, brings us up to the present. This is, again, this is my advice and my tips to you. The personal statement goes through your history, brings us up to the present. The purpose of the Skype interview really is for us to talk about your goals for the future. Let's talk about the, the, the areas of the law that you have an interest in. Let's talk about some of the um, more recent professional experience that you've had, if you're working for a court or a judge or a law firm. Um, and then how, how does all of that come together for what you would really like to do? Where do you see yourself in one year, three years, five years? Those are all questions you should be prepared to answer uh, in an interview. Um, I want to know what types of courses do you hope to study? If you have an interest in intellectual property, for example, I can help you with that. And we can talk about the courses that we have and the options uh, the curricular programs, the research opportunities, the faculty. If you have an interest in maritime law, say the law of the sea or space law, which are you know two kind of interesting areas, but Syracuse doesn't offer those courses, I also want to know that because we can talk about perhaps other options, other schools that might be a better fit for you. So um, I really take advantage of the interview as a conversation to learn more about what you hope to accomplish in the your immediate future. If you would like to take the New York bar exam in the future, we'll talk about that. We'll go through some of the details of what it takes to, to become eligible for the bar exam. If you want to eventually practice in the United States or go back ab abroad or elsewhere, go home. Uh, I want to know these things. I, I take notes. Uh, I refer back to those notes. We use that information when we pair you with a faculty advisor. 
when we um, help you with academic advising for your courses. I uh, share that information with our student mentors who work with our program and help with our students. All of that comes together to help put together a profile on you as the student. So that's really the, um, the lens through which I approach the interview is to learn more about what you hope to accomplish in the future. So I hope that distinction is drawn here in the two pieces we're talking about. While the personal statement focuses on your history, the interview really should focus on your future. And so that's, I think, a nice way to think about those two things conceptually when packaging your ap application and, and the admissions file for yourself. Okay, um, I've said a lot, and there's a lot more to say, <laughs> so uh, we'll keep moving. The interview, in terms of the structure of the interview, uh, it's, it's basic. It's, you know, this should not last more than 15, 20, 30 minutes. Uh, we won't take too long. Uh, I'd like to spend the first few minutes on my own explaining to you a bit of housekeeping matters. We'll talk about the length of the interview, what the general expectations are. Um, if there's any technical difficulties, we'll try to work those out from the beginning. Uh, but then I, 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 my first question is always just to have the student introduce themselves. Tell me a little bit about yourself, what you're currently doing, um, just to get a general sense of uh, the student's comfort with um, the conversation and to learn a little bit about if there's anything that's changed in their application um, since they've applied up to now on um, what we're talking. Uh, and then there'll be a few questions. I usually like to pull a few, few things out of the application. It's not a quiz. I'm not testing your knowledge of your admissions file. Um, my assumption is you're familiar with your own history and background, but I have a general curiosity and interest in perhaps what you did at a particular internship or how you enjoyed a certain course um, or if you were involved in a journal or a moot court. Um, I want to know about those things and just have you speak about them and tell me a little bit more about that stuff. Um, if it's a law school, a foreign law school that I'm not familiar with, that I haven't visited or haven't had many applicants from there, I might ask you to tell me about your law school, um, how many students, what types of activities are you involved in, things like that, just to, again, have a conversation with you and um, get comfortable. Uh, and then, of course, there's always going to be opportunity for questions at the end. That's the part that I enjoy the most because it's an opportunity to gain an insight into what you're really concerned about. If it's housing, when you're in Syracuse, we'll talk about housing. If it's how to select courses, we'll talk about that. Scholarships as well. You know, we offer merit scholarships to students and able to have those discussions about scholarships at that time also. So come with questions, be prepared to ask a few questions. It does show a genuine interest in the program. Uh, and so I think that's an important piece of the interview conversation. All right. And in terms of tips for a good interview, I've just got a few here. Um, be flexible. Scheduling can be tricky. We realize, and I'm certainly keen on the fact that we are uh, coming from very different time zones in a lot of cases. Uh, and so when you're asked to schedule your interview, um, you know, be flexible for one, but feel free to, to propose a few different times. Um, you know, if the morning doesn't work for you or the evening is better or you have a job and you can't break away, let the interviewer know that. Let me know that. Um, I, you know, we're certainly very understanding of the fact that time zones affect uh, your availability, and so try to do our best to accommodate those schedules. Uh, also, of course, ensure that you have access to a strong connection. Skype is the preferred medium, I think, for these interviews. Uh, it usually works well. Um, even in poor connections, we can at least have a call over the uh, microphone without the video, uh, but generally want to test out your connection, make sure you're in a place with a strong connection, have a backup plan as well. If, you, if, you, if a phone is available and a phone number would work, um, share that information with me so that if we lose the connection over Wi-Fi, uh, we can schedule a call and uh, I can give you a quick phone call then. That's fine too. I would assume that you'll be on video. I prefer to start interviews on video. Um, I think it's important that we see each other. Uh, and have a conversation. Most of the interviews will last the entire time on video. Um, if there's a poor internet connection, I usually turn off the camera 
and uh, we'll just speak into the computer. Um, but assume you'll be on video. So just be mindful of that. Um, you don't want to be in a busy, noisy cafe. Um, you want to make sure the lighting is good. Um, all that good stuff. Um, I would review your materials before the, the application, or excuse me, before the interview. This is probably more important if you've submitted your application and then maybe a few weeks go by, sometimes a few months go by before it's complete and ready for the interview. Um, I, like to, I like to wait to interview students until I've got their complete admissions file. So once I have everything, your transcripts, your personal statement, et cetera, um, then I like to have the, the interview. So if there's been some time between when you submit to when you're ready to interview, um, you know, you can forget maybe what you wrote about or, or information you provided. I would give yourself just a few minutes to do a fresh review of your admissions materials because I'm going to be asking you about some of those and you'll want to you'll remember that you've told me certain things um, just for reference and uh, for, for clarification. Do, do ask questions. As I said, this is a valuable opportunity for you to talk to an admissions person. Um, you know, I guess I should, I should also add in here, you know, at the interview stage, if I'm asking you to interview, I'm already favorable towards your application. I already know your scores, your, your grades. I already know your background in terms of your admissions profile. I already see whether you have professional experience or not. Um, you know, it, if, I'm, if I'm interviewing you, I'm interested, and that's a good thing. So um, it's, it's not as if I'm interviewing you to decide, is this person a yes or a no for admission? Is this person denied, going to be denied or admitted? Usually an, an interview is indicative of a favorable admissions decision. So I say that to hopefully remove some of the stress and remove some of the um, nervousness that you might have in, 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 in what we would think of as an interview. Um, you know, again, these are informal conversations that I like to have. Um, and if anything, the value in the interview is more to learn more about you rather than to assess and evaluate whether you're truly an admissible candidate. Okay. So in the context of the questions that you're asking me, don't feel guarded in that I'm judging you based on your questions that you're asking. I would rather you be very honest and frank about concerns you have and questions you have because I'd rather you talk to me about those now um, than let them go unanswered later and maybe, you know, um, it just wasn't a good experience for you and you decide Syracuse is not the right fit. Well, we could have had the conversation or, or talked about certain issues earlier and perhaps that would have changed your, your mind. So, um, I hope that makes sense of it. Um, you know, if you're being asked to interview, that's usually a good thing, and um, it usually leads to a favorable, I think, admissions review uh, for the most part. A few more things here. Um, it is expected that you know a little bit about the program, so my hope is that you've been to our website, maybe you've watched a few of our videos, uh, you know a little bit about um, the structure of our program, uh, some of the, the options we might have, the, the, the academic strengths of our school. Um, so do take some time to review the school's website. You're not going to be quizzed or tested on specific details about Syracuse, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll hope that you've already become somewhat familiar with, with what we're known for, where we're located geographically, um, things of that nature. So just take some time to review the website. Uh, I would avoid reading pre-written answers. I know, as I was saying earlier, the thought of doing an interview or being asked for an interview can sometimes conjure up some fear that this is a, uh, an evaluation process. Uh, and so that might prompt you to anticipate what I'm going to ask and then prepare your own answers. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't worry about that. Um, it's, it doesn't look good. We can usually tell if you're reading a script, if you're reading about your personal history or what you've done in law school. Um, it just, it's not as organic and it's, it's just not that great. It doesn't look that well. Um, and so try to avoid that. Um, it doesn't happen often, but when it does, it's just a little disappointing because the purpose of the interview is really to make these more organic connections with you 
Uh, and so, again, just a tip, something to avoid. Uh, and then lastly, again, don't be nervous. Um, this is truly just a conversation. Um, by the time I've interviewed you, as I said, I've read everything about your application and uh, I'm interested in learning more. I'm, I, I want to move forward with you and uh, that, that's a good thing. So um, don't let any nervousness sort of impact your ability to uh, uh, have a, a good conversation with me and to, to really learn more about me and my program uh, that might be helpful for you in making a decision about the, the law school. So I think we're towards the end. I do want to make a quick uh, plug for Syracuse. Um, I've included just a brief information here about our program. This is uh, one of our entering classes who came in recently. Um, we do have, uh, I think, a pretty robust LLM program, about 35 students each year from about 20 different countries. So we have wonderful diversity. These are human rights lawyers, business lawyers, judges, prosecutors from all over. Uh, and our students can specialize in a variety of areas. We're well known for intellectual property, international business, national security, human rights, disability rights. Those tend to be our core areas. Um, if you'd like to take the New York bar exam, we can, we can guide you in that process as well. Uh, so there are certainly a lot of options in terms of what you'd like to do and, and study here. We offer very personalized academic advising. You'll meet with me. You'll meet with my team of uh, Ella, excuse me, JD students. These are mentors in the program. We also have um, a colleague of mine who is dedicated to supporting our LLM students. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, support from the students. You'll also have a, a faculty advisor as well. And so um, all of our students, I think, are, um, are, are appropriately uh, given the academic resources and the support that we need to succeed. And I think I mentioned that here as well. We do offer conditional admissions. Some students who, uh, whose English, who, whose native language may, be, may not be English, uh, we allow that as well. Um, come in and um, study legal English with us for a semester or a summer. Uh, we have just a variety of different options. Um, programming options. We do a lecture series for our international students, a job shadow program where we expose you to the American legal profession as well. So there's certainly a lot. It's, it's much, there's much here to keep you very busy. Um, and so my hope is as you think about uh, graduate law studies in the U.S., um, do you consider Syracuse? We have the JD, the two-year JD, the LLM, and our hope is to eventually um, develop a doctoral degree, which is in process right now. So with that said, I will open it to questions. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And uh, we'll be here for a little while. So it's a pleasure. No questions? <laughs> That's a very good question, yep. Um, is it hard to get into college after taking a year off? Truthfully, no. Um, it is, especially for, for law school um, and for graduate school, in some ways it can be better to take time off between your, your prior studies and your next level of education, whether that's undergrad or graduate. Um, really, what we're interested in, if you've taken time off between programs, what we're more interested in is what you've done with that time. So if you have 
taken a year off to work, to gain experience, to do field work or research, uh, volunteer experience, community service, anything like that, we want to know about that. We'd like to know why you chose to do that. Tell us what you've accomplished. That's great. I mean, there's no, there's no, um, that, that shouldn't be a detrimental, a detriment to your application. Um, if you've done nothing, you know, and you just needed time away, that, that's also fine too. That won't hurt you in the application. I, I think it can only help you to maybe explain a little bit why you've taken some time off. But it, it shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be a detriment to your, to your application at all. Yeah, that's a good question. So in terms of non-law related backgrounds applying into our law programs, um, currently our Masters of Law requires students to have um, an LLB or a Bachelor's of Law undergraduate degree. That's the same for our two-year accelerated JD program. We are in the process right now of creating an, a Masters of Legal Studies, which does not require prior legal education. And so that would be open to any major, any student from any background or educational major. Um, that degree, we believe, will be offered this time next year. And so um, we are limited a bit in what we can, what we can offer to students with non-law backgrounds. Um, as I said, the LLM and the two-year JD require the Bachelors of Law. A JD, if you're applying for a traditional three-year JD program, like the American-style law school, you can have any major, any academic background, and, um, and apply into it. You would need to take the LSAT exam, which is just a required entrance exam for any American law student as well. Great question. So yes, the Masters of Legal Studies and the Masters of Law are different. Um, in in the U.S., uh, our LLM, the Masters of Law, is traditionally the graduate law degree for lawyers and others who've been educated in law, okay? Um, so the Masters of Law has that threshold requirement of having a law-related background. A Masters of Legal Studies is different in that while you're still learning the law in the program, we open that up to, it, it's regarded as a general graduate degree, and we open it up to any major. So if you are a professional working in human resources, or you're a doctor who wants to learn about the law, or a business person who wants to learn some of the legal concepts that we teach in law school, but you don't have a, a law background, or you don't have a desire to really study the law and become licensed to practice, but you just want a general exposure and general uh, knowledge of the law, that's what the Master's of Legal Study will provide. Substantively, you're taking the same courses. There may be one or two differences in the requirements that we require for each program. But um, it's the major difference is um, what your academic background has been. Law or non-law will determine whether or not you go into the LLM or the Master's of Legal Studies. Great. So in terms of the admissions decisions, how do we make those? That's a great question. For the JD program, for the traditional JD, the three-year program, we look heavily at the LSAT, the GPA, and uh, your personal statement. Those are the three main factors. For the JD program, we do not have the interview piece, so we don't have an opportunity to talk to you about your application and your interest in the program. And so we really look at the, the quantitative, quantifiable numbers, the, the scores from the, the LSAT and the GPA, and then the intangible factors like your personal statement. Letters of recommendation are also important there as well. Um, in terms of the, the quantitative factors there, we have a median in terms of our median LSAT, median GPA. We try to make admissions decisions based on where your scores are relative to that median. So our median LSAT score right now is a 154. We look for LSAT scores around there. We also look for GPA in around 3.3, 3.4. Um, so if your scores are somewhere in those, th those areas, um, and you also have uh, very interesting you know, 
good personal statement, good profile, um, the type of student we want to admit, then that can lead to a favorable admissions decision. For the LLM, for the Masters of Law, it's much different. Um, that's a decision that I make. And we do not require the LSAT exam. So we do not have the benefit of that metric for the admissions review in the LLM program. Instead, I look at your GPA. I look at your grades that you've taken. I can't compare your GPA with that of anyone else from another country or even another school because the, the scale is so different. But I want to know generally how have you performed relative to your own education system. Um, I look at regional diversity. So we want to make sure that we have a class coming in from a variety of different geographic regions, but also legal backgrounds, um, and just make sure we have a diverse class. Uh, the interview is, is important. It's helpful to sort of flesh out some of your interest and perhaps why you might be a compatible fit for Syracuse and why Syracuse would be a good fit for you. Um, and I'm trying to think of what else. I mean, you know, I look at the academic background, the professional experience that you've had, if you've worked, that certainly can help you as an LLM student. Um, and so it's a, it's a variety of factors that are intangible. They just all sort of coalesce and come together to make an admissions decision. The, the LLM admissions selectivity is not, it's not as selective as the JD. Um, simply because we are fortunate enough right now to have capacity for more students. And so we welcome those students to the program. Okay, question here. Can someone with a Master's of Legal Studies also sit for the bar exam? Typically, no. Uh, the, the bar examiners in most states require, if you're a foreign educated law student, the bar examiners require a prior legal education, so a Bachelor's of Law from another country, and an LLM degree from the United States. So if you have those two things with a few other nuances and requirements, you usually can sit for the bar exam, New York as being one example. If you do not have the prior legal education, the Bachelor's of Law degree, and you only have the Master's of Legal Studies, that is unfortunately not sufficient to sit for the bar exam. And so um, they won't, most states will not allow that. There's maybe one exception, which is Washington, D.C., which says if you have 26 law credits, and there are specifics as to what those credits must be in, just 26, then you can sit for the D.C. bar exam. Um, however, that's, a, that's sort of an extreme outlier. Uh, and so I think that, I think the answer to your question generally would be no. What should applicants avoid when writing their personal statements? That's a good question too. You know, I, I focus a lot on what should be put in. What should stay out would be maybe getting too personal. Um, you know, I would keep it professional. Um, talk about your academic background. Talk about um, certainly the work that you've done if you have professional experience. Um, anything other than that, I think is just superfluous and maybe too much. Um, so it's not that I'm telling you, you know, don't mention a specific detail in your personal statement. I'm just saying keep it very concise and complete when it comes to your history. Um, you know, getting back to what I said earlier in the conversation, Spending a lot of time talking about all the great things you're going to do after the law program is not as interesting or important at this stage because I really am curious about what you've accomplished up to this point. Um, I will mention though too, since you've, you've, you've talked about things to avoid, we haven't talked about the resume too much during this conversation, but foreign resumes can be a little personal in terms of indicating religion, uh, marital status, family size, things like that. Um, that's all not important, really. That's not part of our admissions review. So when I say, you know, don't get too personal, I would say you don't need to mention 
um, what your religion is, what your father's or mother's occupation is, things like that. Um, those just aren't common in uh, the documents that we use here in our legal profession, the resume and the personal statement here in the U.S. So just not necessary to mention things like that. Are there any scholarships available? That's a good question. Um, for Syracuse, and I think for most law programs, the answer is yes. Uh, we consider all students for merit scholarships. At the same time, we consider you for admission. Uh, and so there's, for us at least, uh, and I think again for most schools, there's no special application for a scholarship. It's just automatic. We review your admissions file and determine if you are uh, um, a candidate for a scholarship. Here at Syracuse, traditionally our scholarships range from 10% to 50%, about half of our tuition. Um, it's rare, but sometimes possible. We may go up above 50% in very special cases, um, but that's, that's pretty rare. And so usually students can expect to learn at the same time you receive your, your admissions letter, your scholarship decision will be communicated in that letter also. Uh, to students. So, and I'll say, I'll be honest with you, most of our students receive scholarships. I am aware uh, and, um, you know, um, I think um, uh, appreciative of the fact that higher education in the United States is expensive. I think there's a value in that. I think it's certainly, it certainly it has value. But uh, it is expensive, and so we do try to bring down the cost of the program the best we can to make the program a bit more accessible for students coming from countries um, or, or, or personal situations that um, may not be able to afford um, the full price of the program. All right, looks like there are no more questions. Thank you, Andrew, for making time and uh, presenting that extremely informative session to us. Um, I'm sure the students benefited from all the information. The coming week, we are meeting again to discuss US graduate admissions tips and timeline. And I would look forward to meeting with a few of you there. Please note that today's the webinar has been recorded and it's going to be made available on our YouTube channel in the coming month. You have Andrew's email here up on the slide should you feel the need of getting in touch with him. Um, that's the website, sorry. Andrew, would you be comfortable leaving behind your email in case any of, your any of our students want to get in touch with you? So this is my email here, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's uh, oh. uh, yep, ashorsfa at law.syr.edu. Yep. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Prashant, we will send you the link on email. Could you please type your email address and I will write to you with the link of the YouTube channel. Otherwise, if you just write Education USA India on YouTube, our channel should pop up. But in any case, I will uh, email you the link. Thank you everybody for being present with us today. I look forward to connecting with everyone in the coming week. Thanks, Andrew, again. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. The pleasure was ours. We look forward to again connecting with you in the coming months. Um, thanks again. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. You too.